I've mentioned that during the exilic period, there was wisdom literature that came out of it, and the Song of Solomon is a part of wisdom literature. I said in my brief introduction that it's one of the most misunderstood books in the Bible. Some people claim that the Song of Solomon is a book that extols monogamous married love. The problem should be obvious. If this is a book extolling monogamous married love, King Solomon is not your guy. I want to show you how we can understand this book by digging just a little bit deeper through it, taking what it actually says, not what we're being led to read into it. And what we're going to see is, I think, a truly beautiful story. And so we now pick up in chapter four that he attempts to seduce her. He takes her back and he attempts to seduce her. The first strategy he is going to use is flattery. Now, there is some point here that we can see that a man can seduce or court or woo a woman through words. Note the words of Solomon. Behold, you are beautiful, my love. Behold, you are beautiful. Your eyes are doves behind your veil. Your hair is like a flock of goats leaping down the slopes of Gilead. Your teeth are like a flock of shorn ewes that have, sh that have come up from the washing, all of which bear twins, and not one among them has lost its young. So she's got all her teeth. <laughs> you know, and he's complimenting her on this. Now, we might laugh at this, and I'm not sure how uh, advanced dental hygiene was in the day, but she has all her teeth, and this makes her look really Beautiful. This is what Solomon's telling us. And imagine, uh, ladies, if you had a man who noticed you as, as, as in much detail as Solomon is noticing this young girl. And then to top it off, we go down to verse 7 where he says to her, You are altogether beautiful, my love. There is no flaw in you. Wow. You are perfect. You are perfectly beautiful. There's no flaw in you. He is an expert seducer by the sound of it. But we go to verse 12 of chapter 4 and we find that he says of her, A garden locked is my sister, my bride, a spring locked, a fountain sealed. She's resisting him. She is resisting him and she doesn't want to accept his advances. What does she want? She wants to reflect and reminisce about her time with her beloved, the shepherd, because she says in the end of oh, well, verse 16, Awake, O north wind, and come, O south wind, Blow upon my garden, let its spices flow. Let my beloved come to his garden and eat its choicest fruits. This is not about Solomon. This is about the one she's betrothed to. Let him come and get me and get me out of here because it's to him I belong and he belongs to me. So it seems that her beloved tries again. He comes again, and we read in chapter 5, verse 2, I slept, but my heart was awake, a sound. My beloved is knocking. Open to me, my sister, my love, my dove, my perfect one, for my head is wet with dew, my locks with the drops of the night. So he has come a long way in the night. He's dripping with just the moisture of the night, and, and he's looking for her. So what happens? She knows the routine. She hears him. She leaves the harem. She goes out. She gets reunited with him. And away she goes. But that's not quite what happens this time. Because 
We read in verse 6, I opened to my beloved, but my beloved had turned and gone. So he's called for her. She hasn't responded. He's like, oh, I can't find her. My soul failed when he spoke. I sought him, but found him not. I called him, but he gave no answer. Notice this, verse 7. The watchmen found me as they went about in the city. Oh, we remember that last time. And they said, oh, who is your beloved? What does he look like? Where is he? Uh, but this time, this is what happened. They beat me. They bruised me. They took away my veil, those watchmen of the walls. Hmm. I adjure you again, O daughters of Jerusalem, if you find my beloved, that you tell him I am sick with love. This is a message that she's hoping to get to her beloved shepherd. And so we read that the others, the, the women, the concubines of Solomon's harem, say in verse 9, What is your beloved more than another beloved? O most beautiful among women, what is your beloved more than another beloved that you thus adjure us? Why are you resisting Solomon? Don't you know who he is? Don't you know how powerful he is? Don't you know he can satisfy you physically, sexually, financially, emotionally? He can satisfy you. What's your problem, girl? Huh. Her problem is that she's in love and has given her love to a young shepherd man, a young shepherd, a young man who's a shepherd. And they've just asked her, what's your problem? My problem is that I am in love with my beloved. Verse 10, my beloved is radiant and ruddy, distinguished among 10,000. His head is the finest gold. His locks are wavy, black as a raven. His eyes are like doves. Besides streams of water bathed in milk. It goes on. And she is loving everything about her beloved shepherd. He's tanned. He smells like the garden. He smells earthy. His hair is a little bit greasy, but that's okay. It just means he's a worker. He's got strong arms, he's, and on it goes. His body, verse 14, is polished ivory, bedecked with sapphires. She loves his body. She loves him. And on it goes. It gets a bit mushy, but this is how she feels about the one she's actually betrothed to, the one she has given her heart to. This is my beloved, she tells him, verse 16. And this is my friend, O daughters of Jerusalem. And that's the essence of a great relationship, especially marriage. Not just to be lovers, not just to be married, but to be friends. And that's how she was with her beloved. Chapter 6, verse 1. This is an odd question if it's about Solomon, but this is it. Where has your beloved gone, O most beautiful among women? Where has your beloved turned that we may seek him with you? Hmm. Note the answer. My beloved has gone down to his garden, to the beds of spices, to graze in the gardens and to gather lilies. I am my beloved's and my beloved is mine. He grazes among the lilies. So, you know, I don't know that Solomon was necessarily taking time out to go and graze sheep anywhere, but her beloved shepherd lover was. And so we see Solomon continues to attempt to woo her, and it just doesn't work. And we see again flattery in chapter 7, and she's just not buying it. There's all kinds of uh, what people see as erotic sexual language here his hand is on the lock and so on as if this is speaking of, of of the interaction between a husband and a wife sexually but i'm saying she's th th there's probably more uh, non uh, metaphorical language here than we might appreciate because what she's doing is resisting someone 
who was seen as irresistible. And so we see in chapter 8, after all this, Solomon lets her go. He lets her go and she's now on her way back to Engedi and she's just thinking of her beloved. Chapter 8. Oh, that you were like a brother to me who nursed at my mother's breasts. If I found you outside, I would kiss you and none would despise me. Because hmm, I think it was just a, sist a sister being friendly. But here we have her go on. I would lead you and bring you into the house of my mother, she who used to teach me. I would give you spiced wine to drink, the juice of my pomegranate. His left hand is under my head and his right hand embraces me. And she's reflecting, she's remembering, she's reminiscing of the times when they would lay by the pool there at Engedi, that oasis, which you can still go to today. And then back in that day, surrounded by all these beautiful flowers, lilies and so on, as they lay there with his left hand under her head, she says here, and his right hand embraces me, I adjure you, O daughters of Jerusalem, that you do not stir up or awaken love until it pleases again. Don't tell Solomon, but since he's allowed me to go, I'm going. And off she goes. Who is that coming up from the wilderness? Well, it's her, leaning on her beloved. Under the apple tree I awakened you. There your mother was in labour with you. There she who bore you was in labour. Set me as a seal upon your heart, as a seal upon your arm. For love is strong as death. Jealousy is fierce as the grave. Its flashes are flashes of fire, the very flame of the Lord. Many waters cannot quench love, neither can floods drown it. If a man offered for love all the wealth of his house, he would be utterly despised. And you get a picture here that she's now coming back. And is her beloved going to believe her that she didn't succumb to Solomon? Is is she, is it believable that a man of incredible wealth could offer so much to her and she would refuse him for a shepherd boy? Well, one who's now a young man because the years have gone by. And so we, we read, it says in verse 8, the publishers have others. I'm saying it's not others, it's brothers. We have a little sister eh? and she has no breasts. What shall we do for our sister on the day when she is spoken for? You see, they're saying, you're betrothed and you come back home now? When you left here, you had no breasts. But then they say this, verse 9, If she is a wall, we will build on her a battlement of silver. But if she is a door, we will enclose her with boards of cedar. Hmm. Have you been a wall or have you been a door that opened to Solomon sexually? And she says this to them, verse 10, I was a wall and my breasts were like towers. <laughs> then I was in his eyes as one who finds peace. But he let her go. He gave up. Solomon had a vineyard at Balhaman. He let out the vineyard to keepers. Each one was to bring for its fruit a thousand pieces of silver. My vineyard, my very own, is before me. She's now back. There it is. She's standing with her brothers in the vineyard. You, O Solomon, may have a thousand and the keepers of the fruit two hundred. Verse 13. O oh, you who dwell in the gardens with companions listening for your voice, let me hear it. So she says, in an appeal to her beloved, Make haste, my beloved, and be like a gazelle or a young stag on the mountains of spices. So she is now bookending this. This is how she described him right at the start, now right at the end. She's appealing to him, come, let us seize the day because I have 
I have been spoken for, verse 8, and now that day has come. Let us marry. And you know, you could say, well, isn't that a beautiful story? But there's a point to it, and the point is exactly the same as we see in all of the literature, uh, of wisdom literature that comes out of the exile. Be faithful to God. You see, Solomon was someone who not just had many wives, but he had many gods. He was unfaithful to God. His, uh, his polyamory, his uh, polygamy was just a, a symptom of his idolatry, his polytheism, which is un- adul- idolatry, being unfaithful to God. And this young girl, with so much offered to her, she refuses to be unfaithful. And she becomes a prophetic statement to the people of Israel as they return now from their exile. It's a beautiful story. It's one that has the the same point, as I've said, throughout the other biblical exilic literature, the wisdom literature that arises out of the exile. I trust that this stirs your heart too, to be faithful to the Lord. And so, if you haven't given this a thumbs up, please do. If you haven't hit the notification bell, please hit that. If you're not yet a subscriber, please subscribe. And you'll see me in our next instalment as we dig deeper into the Bible's exilic literature.